Before I introduce our speakers who are wonderful, I wanted to ask this maybe silly question, what is biodiversity? It's a word we throw out a lot. I don't know if it holds meaning for everyone, but just to give you a little illumination, it's short for biological diversity, and that's all of the variety of life on Earth. And there are many layers to that. So that's not only the variety of unique species we have on the planet, like some of the ones we read earlier, the red panda or the hairless dog, but also the genetic diversity within species. So the difference between a rattlesnake or a cobra, as well as the diversity of ecosystems we have in the world. So that's landscapes, seascapes, the San Francisco Bay that I can see outside my window and the redwood trees behind my house. Um, all of this diversity includes humans. I think a lot of times we think of ourselves as being separate from biodiversity, but we're not. We're actually on equal footing with all of the other living beings that are part of this web of life. And unfortunately, our actions and our consumption patterns are making it so that we're threatening all of the delicate relationships that exist in this balance of life on Earth. Um, I don't know if this will come as a surprise to you, but biodiversity is being lost at a rate faster today than any time in human history. We're losing 10,000 species a year, and they say that 1 million animal and plant species are currently threatened with extinction, many within as little as a decade. So that's a pretty frightening statistic, and I wanted to lay those stakes before we move on to two of our amazing speakers today, and I wanted to call attention to this idea of biodiversity, um, not as some sort of remote concept, but actually something that threads through all of the different solutions to the environmental crisis as well, including extending to the leadership of the environmental movement. So Planet Women was actually founded in 2020. We're a small startup nonprofit, and a huge purpose for why we created this organization was that we believe the diversity of life on Earth needs to be reflected in the diversity of people empowered to solve the environmental crisis. And so while there are many diverse communities on the front lines being impacted by climate change and species loss, they are not usually the ones with the resources or the power um, that is held by a small number of people from the wealthiest nations. And so we're really trying to invest in solutions that take the ideas of all generations, all nations, all genders and life experiences and thread those together to create a better vision for the future. So that is why I'm so thrilled to welcome our two wonderful guests today, two people from Gen Z, uh, to share their wisdom and what's inspiring them. So just to give you a sense of how the event is gonna break down, they'll each have about 10 minutes to share a little bit about themselves, what they're excited about these days, then I'm going to let them have a free-flowing conversation amongst themselves. The two of them will speak to each other. At that time, you're also welcome to chat in questions, and we'll read them out loud to the speakers as we go. So it'll be a bit of a flowing conversation. So at any time, you're welcome to chat in a question, and Kimberly or myself will read it out loud when we see it. So our first speaker today is Rosie Kahn, co-founder and co-leader of Gen Z for the Trees. That's a project of Rainforest Partnership. It's a fully youth-led initiative to end global deforestation by 2030. I'm very proud to say that Planet Women is a funder for that program because it's wonderful work that they're doing. Rosie is also the founding member of Women for Weapons Trade Transparency, which is a group of scholars, students, and activists who are committed to producing quality research on weapons sales and advocating for corporate and government divestment from war. Rosie, if you cannot tell already, is genuinely brilliant. She recently graduated from University of Texas Austin with a quintuple major in Plan 2 Honors, Government, Economics, International Relations, and Global Studies, and Chinese. Starting this fall, she's going to pursue an International Master's of Environmental Policy at Duke in China, um, and she hopes to work at the intersection of global trade in forest risk commodities and China's environmental policies, which I have no doubt that she will be successful at. Um, and one fun fact, she also teaches martial arts with Texas Wushu. So welcome, Rosie. Thank you so much, Toyo, for the introduction. And I'm really excited to be here today with everyone. Um, Planet Woman has been a wonderful group of people to get to know and to ally with. Um, and I'm so excited to also have this conversation with Isabella. Um, so I do have some slides and I'll just screen share and dive into this. And as I said, um, if you have any questions that come up, go ahead and type them into the chat and we will get to those. Um, so can everyone see the presentation? 
Yes, and there's no like blocks in the way due to Zoom. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is the event and I'm here on behalf of Gen Z for the Trees. We are a fully youth-led initiative on a mission to end deforestation by 2030. Um, and our three pillars are educate, inspire, and change. So the reason uh, why Gen Z for the Trees sort of launched um, in 2020 is right after I came on board as a volunteer intern with Rainforest Partnership, um, the CEO Nyanta had me attend this little webinar hosted by WP Engine, and it was sort of about marketing to Gen Z, actually. And from there, um, there was this interesting statistic that's always stuck with me about how currently Gen Z drives about 40% of consumption globally. And then in 2026, Gen Z will reach about 40% of the workforce. So we're a much bigger generation than we realize. Um, and that just means that we have sort of so much power if we were to come together and try to achieve um, what we want to see in the world. So Rainforest Partnership, a bit about us, the background. Um, RP works with indigenous communities in Peru and Ecuador to basically support the creation of community driven conservation programs. Um, to work towards sustainable livelihoods and creating those economic solutions to economic problems so that they can continue to be the stewards of their land and guardians of the forest. So we have this six pronged integrated approach that uses a lot of conservation research and sustainable livelihoods and engaging with governance issues, as well as global activation programs. Um, so those global programs, if anyone here has heard of or celebrated World Rainforest Day, which is celebrated each year on June 22nd, Rainforest Partnership is the org behind World Rainforest Day. Um, RP also has Films for the Forest as an initiative, which is a global film contest that's all themed around um, just uplifting the different voices and stories from forests and sharing the different, you know, biodiversity that's there and the challenges they face and also opportunities for the renewal. And the third um, global sort of program that RP has is Gen Z for the Trees, which is the youth branch of RP and, as we said, on a mission to achieve uh, the end of deforestation on World Rainforest Day 2030 is when we seek to measure that by building a digital community of youth who work together to tackle the causes of deforestation from different angles. So how do we get there? The three different um, pillars are educate, inspire, and change. Um, and so the reasons for those educate is because there's so much information about the drivers of deforestation, um, what's at stake with the rainforest, why it matters, sort of indigenous history and intersectionality of climate justice and um, racial justice and gender justice that we aren't taught in schools. And so we are self-educating and putting together a lot of materials to educate Generation Z about all these things that we are not taught in schools. So that looks like reading the little book of big deforestation drivers for enrichment over winter break and reading up about what is the universal mill list, how does it work and how can we contribute to it and understanding you know, what, whose lands are we on and all of these things. The second pillar, Inspire, is about basically combating the negative psychological toll that is put on Gen Z by a lot of alarmist media and this negative bias in reporting and focusing only on this sort of doom and gloom narrative, which we all know it's it's very serious, the situation that we're in, but that's also not the full story. There's so much good work being done every single day by people around the world, and those stories also deserve to have their chunk of the narrative, because we can't really build um, a more thriving world if we can't visualize it easily, and if we're only focusing on the negative narrative, then it's going to be a lot harder for us to um, stay optimistic, hopeful, and keep working. So these are some graphics just taken from um, older Instagram posts we had made and some clips of different um, articles that we've taken a look at. And then the last pillar change is about giving Gen Z um, a way to channel our energy and our collective power and numbers towards campaigns that kind of put all of our voices together into one focused ask. Um, and so some of the different campaigns we have include a global restaurants research and advocacy um, campaign, which is going to be analyzing the sourcing policies of the world's largest food and restaurant companies focusing on those companies because they're the last point of the supply chain before sort of um, commodities just spread out to all individual households and buyers and things. So it's the idea of voting with your dollar, but actually rather than just making individual purchasing behavior changes that can't directly 
and with um, certainty change what a grocery store is stocking on their shelves, we're looking to kind of amplify everyone's voices together, do the research, and then in a constructive way, tailor some recommendations to different companies saying, here's what you're doing better than your competitors, and here's the next steps that you should be taking to um, you know, further your commitments to stopping deforestation in your own supply chain, assuming that they've already made those pledges. Um, and so this is a bunch of pictures uh, in the process where Gen Z for the Trees engaged in a palm oil mapping project in the past. Um, there's a lot of self-education we did. You can see this Google document with a ton of articles we are reading to get a grasp on this, as well as spreadsheets we put together and maps. And after this um, session, I think they'll be sending out some links for y'all to read. And one of those is the palm oil blog, which Jamie and I um, wrote about after we engaged with this project. Um, so you can look forward to reading that full story of the palm oil project after this. Okay, so uh, in my remaining time, I'm not gonna breezing through the slides, but I'm going to engage in a quick educate, inspire, change um, slideshow with all of you all. So I'm sure a lot of people have seen these sort of slogans in the past saying there's no environmental justice without social justice or racial justice is climate justice. And me for the longest time, I thought, yes, this is true, but I didn't really sink into me why it's true. So we're talking about educate right now. Here's something that I actually was taught in school, surprisingly, um, and it's about the 1610 Orbis spike. So um, I can't really see people raising their hand, but I want you to think about if you've heard of the term Anthropocene before. Um, a lot of people probably will kind of be familiar with it. And it means the age of man. And it's a new sort of word that gets thrown around because currently we're we are in this geological era called the Holocene. Um, and people are kind of coining a new term called the Anthropocene to refer to the age of man because um, humankind has, has such a big impact on planet Earth's just climate and geological happenings. Um, and so scientists had a big debate on when the Anthropocene should be defined as starting because we can't just randomly declare a new geological era. There has to be some physical proof uh, that points to that, some, some big change that is like, okay, this is where it starts. And so they dug these ice and rock cores from glaciers and from different places. And in those cores, they could go back and track and find, and it points to the year 1610. There's like a seven, uh, parts per million drop in atmospheric carbon dioxide um, that you can see here in this slide. And that is probably um, caused by the death of tens of millions of people after European conquest of the Americas and the regrowth of large swaths of forest on previously agricultural cultivated land. And so if you think about the implications of this, that the start of the climate crisis is literally defined at this point that was driven by anti-indigenous um, worldviews and actions, then that goes to kind of make me understand and hopefully make everyone understand why there can be no environmental justice without centering indigenous peoples and all of these issues of social justice because they just cannot be separated. It's one and the same thing. And these um, sort of colonial mindsets of that people are separate from nature, like Joanna had mentioned earlier, or that nature is just a resource to be exploited, or that um, there is such thing as like terra nullis, like um, uninhabited lands and that there's just this erasure of indigenous people, that is the driving mindsets behind all of the actions that are contributing to the climate crisis. And so with that educational thing, um, here's something inspirational. Um, and again, I can't really ask people to like raise their hands, but I um, would like to ask people if they've heard of solar punk as a term, as a genre. Probably a lot of people haven't, um, but most people have heard of steampunk or cyberpunk. And so steampunk is historical and dystopian. It's very gritty and greasy. And um, in contrast, cyberpunk is futuristic, but still dystopian. It's very sci-fi, but there's a lot of, you know, 
neon lights, dark, scary cities, and everything is still dystopian, there's a bad government, whatever it may be, it's generally a genre of speculative fiction, um, but it's not very hopeful. Solar punk, on the other hand, is sort of the inverse and converse of each of these because it's futuristic, unlike steampunk, but it's utopian fiction, unlike both of them. Um, and so solar punk is this new sort of emerging genre of speculative fiction and artwork, and it's also a political movement that basically envisions a world in which things are getting much better which is much in contrast to a lot of the dystopian um, writing and media, which my generation especially has grown up on, things like the Hunger Games and all of these different sort of stories, um, which very much are reflected in our modern day, which is obviously terrifying. Um, and so I think solar punk is a really interesting, and um, powerful, inspirational tool for us to, like I had mentioned earlier, the whole purpose of that inspire pillar is to change the narrative um, that we put so much emphasis on. Um, this is a real photo of the um, gardens in Singapore. And so solar punk is both an aesthetic and a political movement. Um, and I'll paste these into the chat when I'm no longer screen sharing, but there's a really good a sort of essay or manifesto that helps to define solar punk um, and how we can start to see it in the real world before we get to that point of very futuristic looking architecture. Um, so solar punk is something that I just wanted to share with you all. I'm excited to have more conversations on that with Isa and with everyone else. And then um, jumping to the concept of change for the third pillar, um, Rainforest Partnership in the Ecuador community has recently um, opened a fundraiser to help the communities sort of achieve different goals, whether that's working on beekeeping or funding different sort of territorial technology and detection um, to guard their community lands. So there's this link is also here. Um, and this is one sort of easy way for us to come together and help the communities by just making a simple donation. Um, but it's also the sort of Engagement goes further than that, of course, because when you're donating to Rainforest Partnership and supporting these communities with these achievements, um, their stories will continue to be published through our blogs and through social media. San Isla and Sanaida herself has different social media that you can follow their work. Um, and so it's really inspiring to have conversations with these folks. Um, and I hope that everyone will um, consider donating to them. So I will stop screen sharing because I think I've about run 10 minutes um, and I'll pass it back to the moderators. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for my rushed presentation. And um, these are our um, social media handles um, for those who would like to follow us. Thanks so much, Rosie. Um, Amazing as always. I'm so glad that you shared about solar punk. I was going to ask if you did not share about it. So great. Can't wait for us to chat about that later. And um, the links that Rosie shared, we will put in the follow-up email too. So everyone will have access to those. Uh, and now I want to introduce Isabella Cortez Lara, the Director of Conservation for Women for Conservation, another partner of Planet Women. She is an amazing firework of a human being, a passionate conservationist, a committed feminist, a performer and artist of indigenous ancestry, born in Popayan, Cauca, Colombia. Um, women for Conservation, where she works with her mother, the co-founder, is a nonprofit that empowers women in rural communities around key biodiversity areas. She also directs two nature reserves in Northern Colombia. She's also an amazing artist. You saw her um, murals that she painted on our invitation. Those were actually photos of paintings that she'd made. As an artist, she's known as Isa Vibe. We will put her handle also in the email that we're following up with. Her art appears as murals in galleries, on nature reserves, and digitally. She uses her creative forces to advocate for endangered species protection, rights of the LGBTQ community, rights of indigenous communities, reproductive rights, and conservation of ecosystems. She has a BS in wildlife and fisheries management and conservation ecology from West Virginia University. And she is right now finishing a master's in natural resource conservation at the University of Kent in England. So welcome up, Isabella. Cannot wait to hear today. Hello, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm gonna share these slides. Can everyone see them? All right. Okay, I apologize for my voice. <laughs> my name is Isabella Cortez Lara. I'm from Cauca 
And I come forth with an interesting proposal of how to inspire people to create change in their corner of the earth, to collectively create change throughout the, the world. So <clears throat> my corner of the earth is Colombia, and I work primarily in the rainforests as well as Paramo regions. And my life has been very intertwined with conservation from because my parents founded Fundacion Pro Aves, which has 28 nature reserves all across Colombia. So since I was very little, they would take me on expeditions into the very dense jungles. And I was able to connect very strongly with this part of myself, as well as with my indigenous ancestry, with my mother's side and my father's side. And the connection of the deep spiritual um, movements that are happening with Pachamama. And my way of translating it is different to my parents because my parents are very, very strong ornithologists that love birds. I love birds as well, but I feel connected to frogs as well. And I feel very connected to um, the art side of, of conservation. And I've kind of made my own style. <laughs> So everywhere I go, I always do a mural. And so this, this piece, Women for Conservation here, Mujeres por la Conservación, is a connection of different murals that I've done. And most recently, my biggest project to date is the creatively directing the Rana Chiva, which is um, this. The Rana Chiva is this design with the original um, artwork, as well as a combination of like, realism and a cartoon which was created for a bus a magic school bus throughout Colombia um, okay and it all stems from this species which is the the tree frog Colombian tree frog which comes from the base of the paramo and the paramo is very important because there's very very sacred cosmology in this areas that are represented as the balance between the astros and the people and most of the paramos are actually in indigenous land in Colombia and this one is in Santander which is very important because in the moment there's a lot of deforestation due to um, mining so I wrote this song to promote the work but also to promote the sacred origin of life and I talk about life being water and I strongly believe in this saying which is Ache Dios O that water is God and that water the connection of everything is basically life and that life source needs to be protected. And so I created this piece which was then used for all of the rest of the bus. And this is the Rana Chiva, the magic Colombian school bus. And it has traveled to 22 different schools and it has given classes to thousands of children throughout Colombia. And then from there, I designed the, the, the Rana Chiva logo and also the guides, field guides for birds and different prizes for children so that they become more motivated to participate. And so we do a lot of activities with them and they get different like pieces, original pieces from me. Um, and also we do a lot of work with other artists in the region and promoting women's participation especially because we have seen th these areas are very high in conflict and civil war and one of the best ways to get everyone to just talk and and really connect is by doing something artistic which is either the head or you know making mochilas which is is making with your your uh, I don't know weaving it's weaving and so it, it's something that you wouldn't understand from the outside looking in but it's something that really connects you with the people that you're working with and allows you to open up and be vulnerable in these spaces as well as innovation and conservation is looking at it in a different angle and trying to be as accessible and as in including as many people as possible from all of, of the ages and to make it accessible, not just to academics. And so that, that really is my part of my story that comes intertwined because I have been very frustrated with conservation um, throughout my life, feeling that it doesn't really tell the story or it doesn't actually take into consideration ways to look into communicating. So I made it myself. I've made my own way <laughs> to communicate and I have also gotten, you know, I've done things in the university, but one of the main things that I really want is my art to be always accessible to people. And that's why I'm a muralist, 
instead of just gallery artists because I, I really want as many people to be involved as possible. And that's my greatest inspiration is to create murals, which then I turn into this digital art. Um, I don't think you can see it, but I turn it into digital art and then, you know, I, I give prizes to people or I donate it and I, I want to be able to connect as many people to the message as possible. And this is the project with Women for Conservation that we work throughout 11, new, 11 sites now. We've been growing a lot with the, with the help with Planet Women and it's been marvelous to grow as well as an individual because I have learned so many new techniques and I have been so blessed by this team to be able to learn how to, to create these spaces to have people speak about what is actually happening. And that is what I'm doing for my thesis as well. Um, I am reviewing and evaluating projects as well as looking at intersectionality and conservation and listening to people's perspectives. And it all stems from my grandmother, who is the inspiration of the, the logo. And her name is Amparo, which means light. Uh, and my mother who took on the project as well uh, after her death. And so now I'm the third generation that has come forth uh, to, to do things as, as I see and feel that it should be done. And my work uh, really stems from these project sites, but more, more, more prominently in La Sierra Nevada Santa Marta is where I've grown up and where I have worked my, my, my professional life. And this is the, the location. It's in the, in the north of Colombia. And I have, give classes on conservation. And we also have many people who come and talk about different biological importances of, of deforestation, how to prevent it, and what are the, the ways to, to move sustainably through sustainable livelihoods, either by teaching people how to manage their small micro businesses or how to really get into bird tour guiding because it's very lucrative right now and trying to stem away from so much pressure on agro and um, deforestation in certain areas that are sub um due to people's needs because the conservation sometimes really takes doesn't consider people's needs and so I really I really feel that women have always been on the front line and have always been the ones who have taken the worst of the cases and that is a, a lot of my work right now is actually listening to the cases and understanding and trying to be conscious of it because people want to put forward a project but in reality the situation in in, in Colombia is very difficult and it is dangerous so women have always been a face in that, especially in the war and all of the things that have happened in the Sierra Nevada, but also in the rest of these areas that are Paramo because it's so rich in biodiversity, people fight over it. And um, yeah, I do a lot of tribute. So I don't know if you noticed, but in the Ranachiva, I actually put Gonzalo in, in the design as well. So he could travel with us. And so Gonzalo is a forest guard. Um, unfortunately, we lost him after 22 years of conservation, but he lives through our art and he lives through the movement. So that is a very important part of my message of like how I can take influences from different areas and, and, and continue the story as much as possible. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my story also is very intertwined with this area, which is a Paramo region in, in Tolima and with the yellow eared parrot, which is the foundation of this organization, which is this parrot right here. And we continue to stem out and continue to grow. And my, my purpose is to really try and engage as many people as possible and the new generation, our generation, my generation, my little brother's generation in the most positive way possible because I feel that it's so detrimental to get into these very depressing mental states and that's another form of control. So I, as many in all of the projects that I can and, and where I make presence, I always tell people that there is so much to be done and that we shouldn't, we shouldn't throw the towel in because there's no way that, that we can't fail. It's, there's no way we can fail. We're the chosen ones. So it's, it's that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. That was wonderful. If anyone has any questions for either of these two, please put them in the chat and we'll ask them when we see them. In the meantime, uh, Isabella and Rosie, I open it up to the two of you if you have any questions or comments that you want to share with each other and 
just keep keep the conversation going and I'll chime in when I see questions in the chat. Awesome. Um, yeah, Isa, I don't know if you had any questions to start. I guess I can start with one question, um, which is when, so like I, my, um, like on the ground experience being in the rainforest was just through a pretty brief like study abroad program in Costa Rica. Um, and so a lot of the photos in your slides remind me of being in like Corcovado National Park and the Monte Verde Cloud Forest Biological Station um, were all really wonderful. And only those lived experiences have sort of enabled me to just understand like what it's like and what the temperature of the air feels like and things like that. Um, but like when I come back to my university, I kind of found it hard to explain to people and convey to them those same experiences so that they would understand why the rainforest is so special and what kind of challenges the people face there on their small fincas and um, just all the economic challenges as well. Um, so for you studying in the United States and now in um, the UK, what are your kind of ways of going about communicating these things um, in, in conversations or maybe conversations after people have seen your murals, your paintings? Can I be honest? I think people think I'm just crazy. <laughs> I, I feel like there's so many things that are just not understood by academia. And I try to portray it. Um, and I feel that there's so many intricate details of like the intrinsic value of, of the, the forest and the connection and the fact that it's all communicating with it. It's this one giant organism, one giant consciousness. Um, I feel like a lot of people take my message as very kumbaya and very like spiritualist. And, and I don't take, I don't get taken seriously very often, <laughs> but it's the, you know, it's, it's just maybe how I'm for how I express it, but I try to be as um as sincere and, and and genuine as possible and i feel that now in this society there's a change and young people really take my message very well it's the older generation i have problems with so you know gen z is is for it with me but for my perspective but it's the older generation that really like has a lot of setback in the in terms that you know it seemed like too kumbaya and too airy to be, you know, something to be taken seriously or not measurable or, you know, so uh, I do, you know, I'm not going to lie, I can't lie, I have a big issue with that, but I, I really think that you, we have to step out of that, uh, out of those boxes mentally, we have to step out, it's too complex, you can't put nature in a box, there's so many things happening simultaneously, and so much energy that you know you can't put that into an excel sheet you know you can you can look at different things and indicate but i feel like the human nature human soul is the same way and so we must always be positive and speak with love and light and that's that's how i try <laughs> and i have a question for you are you so you you do all of this work in the rainforest but have you ever considered going and living in the rainforest and being there extended time and yeah, I have considered it. Um, in the one month that I spent in Costa Rica, it was just so wonderful. And um, there's so many overlaps as well with just the like anti-war work and the um, research that I do with Women for Weapons Share Transparency, because I was interested to find out in Costa Rica, they're one of the few countries that um, doesn't have a military. They abolished their military, I think, in 1944 after a civil war. And so there is even a community of Quakers that immigrated the United States and settled in Costa Rica so that they wouldn't have to be drafted into the army in the United States. And because Costa Rica abolished their military, they have more um, sort of just government funds to go towards payments for environmental services to subsidize people to not cut down their lands or to not, um, you know, engage in too much destructive land use. Um, and so there's all these overlaps there. And I think that there's there's so much more vibrancy like you're talking about in the rainforest areas um, that I would consider um, living there and working there. Um, as Jojo had introduced, I'm going to be in China for almost two years um, starting this fall to work on um, a master's in environmental policy, but specifically because I'm half Chinese and half Pakistani, um, 
and can speak Chinese, I want to work at the intersection of um, China's environmental policies, which are not as you know long history and developed as those in the United States or in Europe, just because um, ever since, I guess, 1980s, China has been mostly focused on economic growth and recovery. And just now they're starting to worry about their um, domestic pollution issues. And they're not quite at the point of working on what kind of environmental harm are they importing. Um, and so because China is the top importer of a lot of forest risk commodities, um, I want to work on that intersection, but I'm also hoping that there's more open mindedness among youth across the world, but also in Chinese society, because um, a lot of like my grandparents and a lot of Chinese peoples are indigenous to their village lands. And we have all of this wisdom about like the 50, not the 52, the 20 something different weeks, uh, sorry, seasons. Um, like in the Western culture, we have like four seasons, summer, spring, fall, and winter, but in the Chinese um, traditional agricultural calendar, there are seasons that change every two weeks that describe the different changes in like climate patterns. And there's different crops that are correlated to the appropriate time to plant there. And so um, I think they have a maybe more open understanding of, like you said, that everything is this like big organism when you have like an ecosystem it's like it's all alive and it's all connected scientifically through the root system and stuff like that but because the water flows and the water is so important um and the people that live there are not outsiders they are a part of that ecosystem um i'm hoping that when i am done with my masters maybe i will be living and working um somewhere in china where there's forests or somewhere in um, Central America or South America. You are always welcome in Colombia, my friend. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I have a couple questions in the chat, so I'm gonna throw some in. The first that I saw was from Susan and it's for Rosie. Can you tell us more about what Gen Z is currently working on? I assume she means Gen Z for the trees. Although if you wanna speak for your whole generation, go for it. I think I'll take the former. Um, so Gen Z for the Trees is currently working on, um, we're like, we had a restructuring. So we, um, for the first couple years of our existence, we had project teams focused on different commodities. So there's a team researching palm oil, soya, beef, and timber pulp and paper. Um, but recently we restructured to mission teams so that we're not siloed into just analyzing these commodities, but now we're going to be more focused on educate, inspire, and change. Um, and so rearranging that, recruiting a few more people, that's the immediate project. Um, but we, in the coming year and beyond, are going to be focusing on launching the Global Restaurants Campaign. Um, so a really interesting report where there's a lot of original research that we've done that compiles and analyzes um, the sourcing policies from the world's largest 34 food and restaurant companies. Um, and then going out and contacting these companies. Um, and like I said, just asking them um, to take these next steps and consider our sort of advice as if we were consultants pro bono. Um, one more interesting thing that is coming up about a week from now is I'm getting to be um, the keynote speaker at the first Inter-American Conference of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Um, so that's gonna be a really interesting couple days um, where I'll be speaking to a lot of like companies that are members of the RSPO. Um, and there's so many nuances around palm oil that it, it is responsible. It's one of the drivers of deforestation. It's responsible for a lot of deforestation in South America and Central America and also in Southeast Asia. Um, but there, there is a such thing as sustainable palm oil in the sense that it's four to 10 times more land efficient and water efficient than comparative things like soy oil or canola oil. Um, and so in terms of land use, we could, we should be growing more palm oil, but we just shouldn't be cutting down standing rainforests to cultivate it on that kind of land. Um, and so all of these nuances, I think Gen Z needs to be more educated on them as consumers to make the right choices and support, su and support selecting the sustainable choice rather than trying to boycott it wholesale, because I could talk forever about palm oil, but um, palm oil is in like 50% of the items you can see in a grocery store. So trying to boycott it is really difficult. There are so many derivative chemicals that it's just in everything. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're working. <laughs> awesome. 
Um, I have one from Christine, and this is for both of you. Uh, Christine says, I grew up being angry and resentful toward generations that came before me, like the silent generation and baby boomers. Are you angry with Gen X and millennials? And how do you channel that anger? Um, I can take this one first. I think that I am, I don't buy into the idea that there's like a generational fight to be fought. I think that um, there are class divisions and there are ideology divisions and it's um, usually the ideologies that are harmful, like I had said about the just anti-Indigenous worldviews um, and people that people that are ignorant of it, I think, can be educated. Um, but the mainstream form of thinking that we're taught, speaking as someone who grew up in the United States, um, is just erasure coupled with these concepts and being someone who majored in economics with the intent of understanding and seeing through all the like weird um, oversimplifications that economic models are built on, I think that it's not a generational conflict. Um, and I have a lot of you know high school teachers who I love who are millennials, and we're, we're all on the same page. Um, so for me, I don't feel angry at generations um, above mine, but just angry at people in like positions of power that have decided to choose greed over life. Yeah, I, I feel like I wouldn't put everyone into the same boat um, and generalize because I, I, I honestly feel like it's very difficult to generalize in, gen in, in, in the generations that came before. I feel like there's so many wonderful people so many people of light and that are really working for it and that have tried to but yeah I would second that it's some people in power but it's not anger that I feel I feel like you know it's you when you become conscious of how all of the cogs work you just start to become a little wiser so as I've started to really look into conservation and how it was founded and the beginning of it you know conservation is actually very problematic and I feel that that makes me want to do make more change and to be more and to be different and to use a new model and um so it's successful because it it, it has to you know it has waves of emotion towards these these big issues but I I feel like one of the most important aspects is to just continue to stay positive as much as possible if I start to take on that frequency of anger my it will it will influence a lot more and yes there's some activists who you know really really do a lot of work with that and empower and impassion a lot of people um but I feel if I did that it would it would it would be dangerous <laughs> because it, I, I may cause chaos. So I would rather use my light in a way that really kind of shines a way for us to do more work because I feel that multinational corporations really care more about a check than the checks and balances that keep life on earth. But then again, we're the ones that pay for these products and we're the ones that do you know, go out of our way to work to get these things. So maybe changing that perspective or enlightening people as to like how to make better decisions with their with their consumption is is one of the better ways to do it instead of being angry. Beautifully said, both of you. Uh, we have a question for Isabella from Susan. Uh, Susan says, "I'm an artist as well, and what medium do you use to create your artwork, and where do you get your inspiration for new work?" Well, I am a multimedia. I, I really like, um, I like oil painting, but I also like using like vinyl painting or like uh, oil based. Some of them like the, are oil based or, are good, but you can make them. Um, and I also, you know, I'm, I'm a dancer and a musician. And honestly, I just take so much inspiration from the things that I, I live and see every day, maybe from the pain sometimes and the sadness also as well is a really big inspiration for me and and how to turn that into something positive but also really I would suggest that the best thing to do is to travel is to travel as much as possible you know 
travel and see new cultures and new peoples is probably one of the single hand and best things you could do. And so um, maybe if you have the time, you know, try and get a way to, to go to a community you have absolutely no idea about how they work and just live there. <laughs> That's very good inspiration. Okay, is there, there's another one. We have to build some a better place. And then what? Yes, then what? Then what do we do when we build a new place? That was Rosie's. Rosie, do you want to say more about your comment? Oh, no, it was sort of just like a, I agree. And it's sort of like a rhetorical question um, because I absolutely agree. The um, fellow youth activist, Shia Vasida, has spoken about why it's so important to work from a place of love instead of anger, because the anger will just burn you out and that's not sustainable. Um, and if you're driven by the anger at some multinational companies or like a tr you want revenge, you, you are so um, negative, then... Um, it's not like you have the focus on the positive things. Um, and so when it comes to what systems are there going to be, if we were to change things, you have to be able to focus on those. Um, so I'm interested that you mentioned your thesis work. Um, in my undergraduate thesis um, for earlier, I had also done a creative thesis. So in terms of like art, I dabble in painting and music, but I mostly do writing. Um, so like storytelling in, in print and, um, I wrote like a eight chapter solar punk novella that follows a junior national park ranger working in Thailand 50 years in the future, trying to help her team stop like in wildlife and ivory trafficking operation. Um, and just like visualizing what the world could look like in 50 years in a solar punk future um, and how things work and what conflicts still exist and how drone technology plays into all kinds of questions like that. Um, and it was a really fun exercise. And I've also been able to share that with a lot of my friends and inspire them and teach them about solar punk. Um, so seeing them like light up when they get to talk about something positive instead of just be like shaking their heads and be like, what are we supposed to do when we're talking about all the negative things? Um, I think is it's evidence that it's so important to, like you said, work with the positive energy. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like it really instills violence just to, you know, like really like, and I feel like that's very counterproductive, um, but it's, you know, there's a lot of people that use it in a way, and that's fine. I have no, nothing against what anyone else is doing, but I think that you're completely correct there in how you use your energy, your energy budget, and the conservation has to, you have to know about your energy budget, and I think I'm reading a question here about, like, how to make importance of time, and uh, for me, well, I, I feel I, I live every day like I'm going to die tomorrow and I want to live a, a better life for everyone else. And I live like, you know, it's not I don't want to be doom and gloom or anything, but like I, I sincerely feel and live like every single second is like that's the last it. That's it. And I have lived like that for many years, my whole life. And I feel that has pushed me to really push myself in every way in every single way and not to take breaks really I do sometimes but I have to have the, the creative ability to be as crazy and weird as I want to be because this is my life and I may never come back maybe I reincarnate and see the trees that I planted that would be fantastic but for now I just want to leave a better life and 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 world for everyone and I I just want to be accepted as who I am very well said. Yeah. Um, I agree about sort of just like not holding yourself back and waiting for some better future date to do the thing that you want to do. Um, for me, I've, as you can probably tell someone who had five majors, my approach to life is always yes. And um, so we just pile things on and find the ways that they overlap. And there's been so many like graceful connections between my research with women for weapons trade transparency and um, the intersection of like militarism and the environment and what I'm learning when I'm researching things for rainforest partnership um, and martial arts has played an interesting part in adding like a balance to my life. Um, so I specifically pursued, pursued learning Chinese martial arts to connect with my heritage more. 
Um, and a lot of what we learn in that is like the importance of balance and the contrast between moving slow and moving fast. And um, it's sort of just like, whenever I'm like t telling people what wushu is because they don't know that word as commonly as kung fu, um, wushu is how you actually say martial and art in the Chinese language. And kung fu doesn't mean martial arts. It just means like discipline, diligence, hard work in achieving some kind of goal. Um, and so I think learning wushu has helped me apply more kung fu to the rest of my life um, and knowing what to prioritize and being able to make time for the things that I know um, benefit everyone in the long run. Let's see, Kimberly has this question, what is a critical step people can take to support a thriving future? For me, I think the first critical step people have to take before they can take any other actions to support a thriving future would be changing your mindset. Um, so like, if what Isabella was talking about, like how water is life and all of these things are connected, doesn't really make sense to you, then trying to like educate yourself more on that and um, following and reading a bunch of indigenous um, writing and just, reteaching ourselves the things because we're in in the global west so immersed in the anti-indigenous worldview um that only once you step out of that and lean into the different mindset then you can work in a field like conservation without having these kind of harmful impacts where you try to separate people from nature um. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is funny I I think well I'm not the best person to take advice from because I don't have like my life all like organized but I can tell you my perspective I think the most important thing to to support a thriving future is to begin with um really understanding yourself and accepting yourself and accepting the weird wonderful parts or even the parts that are hard to accept or that you don't like and then irradiating that energy outwards and bringing people into that as well. And how do you do that? Well, you have to be selfish. You have to be selfish and you have to, to have a thriving future. If I put other people before me and, you know, for example, if I had like meaningless relationships and just put everyone else before me, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now because I am actually, I do a lot of work for other people, but I am extremely selfish in how I spend my time and how I spend my energy. So I feel like that is very important to start to, to build into the Gen Z because Gen Z is really like, oh, like oversharing or like everything is like revolves around like the social, the social, social, social. And like that is very detrimental for your soul because you need to really understand yourself and then project outwards. And to do that and to avoid burnout really is to take those spaces and time to, to, to be, allow yourself to be selfish and not you know, and not buying things, but being, 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 sitting under this tree, looking at this bird for an hour, like, you know, maybe that's not productive, but that's what you need. You need to, 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 to get into it, to the groove, to, to soak in the energy. And that takes time. And that takes time that you may be giving to someone else, but you should give it to yourself always. And that's how I avoid burnout because I am extremely careful with how and where I spend my time. And I just allow myself to be as weird as I want. I think that is a pretty brilliant place to end. I want to keep this conversation going, but we have two more minutes until everyone is ready to sign off. So I just want to say I'm so grateful for both of you for being here. Um, and for being alive at the same time that you're alive and having you out in the world. Um, so appreciate all the work that you both do. And I cannot wait to follow your careers. And like I said before, hopefully work for you one day. <laughs> um, you're both so amazing. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined and listened into the conversation. Thank God we recorded this so we can all watch it again and listen to it over and over to get our daily dose of inspiration. In the follow-up email that we'll be sending, we'll include the links that they shared, as well as any extra info that either of these folks want to share with us. So you will have materials to read, um, and we'll also share their organization so you can check them out and donate. 
Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. And feel free to unmute yourself if you want to say goodbye to everyone. Thank Happy you. Happy anniversary day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everyone. Great to be with Thank you. Thank you all. all. <laughs> the Mars in El Dorado right now. <laughs> I, it looks like it. I can see that. Oh, I, I was laughing. I was laughing. I was too busy laughing. It was. Um, I enjoyed uh, how. I enjoyed how both of your life experiences um, teaches wisdom, complex ideas, but in a way that just makes me feel all warm inside. And so I, I took that both from your um, uniquely different perspectives that are, of course, um, beautiful different sides of perception, the coin, and how to solve complex problems and. I love just listening to your wisdom. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, y'all. So Have much. A day. Hi, Nianta. Nice to see you. Bye. bye. So lovely to see you all. Bye bye. Bye, friends. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rosie. Bye, Rosie. <laughs> see you again soon. Thank you so much.